you ever been in a situation where you were trying as hard as you could to explain something to somebody else and they just couldn't get it? I have that happen to me on a somewhat regular basis trying to teach chemistry. Uh, but, but maybe that's been your experience at times. So you were just trying so hard, pulling out all the stops, everything you could think to do, and, you, and they just couldn't get it. What about a situation where you were trying just as hard as you could to understand what someone else was trying to tell you? And you, you just, the, the connection wasn't there. You just, you just couldn't understand. If, if we think about it, communication can be difficult even when both parties are trying very hard to make it happen. And it's a lot more difficult when one or both of the parties are not really trying very hard. And, and with that kind of thing in mind, I want us to turn our attention to the idea of God communicating with man. Now here's a situation where one party is trying to communicate with another. That used to be that God would communicate in all different kinds of ways with, with men and women through dreams and through visions, sometimes sending messengers, angels. He would do that. But, but ever since the time that God's Son, Jesus Christ, walked the earth, ever since the time that Jesus gave His teaching, to the apostles, ever since the time that the Holy Spirit inspired men to write the books that we now have in our New Testaments, ever since that time, God has chosen to communicate with men through the written word. He speaks to men today through the Bible. And the Bible tells us that. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. How does God train men, tell men what they need to know in order to be equipped for every good work? According to the Apostle Paul, he does that through the Scriptures. And it is the Scriptures that communicate to us what we need to know concerning how to worship God concerning the church, concerning faith, concerning heaven and hell, concerning the dangers of sin, concerning salvation and a host of other things. The New Testament is there to communicate those things to us. And there are two things I think we should notice about this. One is that God can communicate with us any way that He wants to. But He has chosen to use the written word to communicate with men today. The second thing that I want us to keep in mind is that God, being who He is, has the ability to communicate perfectly. No matter how He chooses to do it, He has the ability to communicate perfectly. Now people sometimes wonder, they, they question, is it possible really for the Bible to adequately address the needs of man in the 21st century well, this is communication from God. Yes, it is possible. There's no flaw in anything that God does. And of course, the question that people often ask is, but why? Why did God choose to communicate in this way? And, and, and all we can really do is speculate. You know, I, I could say that maybe God wants followers who love Him enough to make whatever effort they have to make to understand what He says to them. I could suggest that maybe there's more glory to God if we give our hearts voluntarily through a diligent study of His Word and if we strive to understand, then there would be if we had no choice in the matter. But speculation is really pointless here. God has decided what God has decided. He has chosen what He has chosen. The task that we have is to understand the communication that He's written. And that's what Bible interpretation is all about, trying to understand what God has written to us. So this morning, I want us to think just a little bit about some of the basic principles of Bible interpretation. I have to tell you, there have been times in my life when if I could have found a way 
I would have eradicated the word interpret and all of its forms from the English language. I would have gotten rid of it so it could never be used again. And the reason I say that is because I've had so many conversations with people who, whenever we have uh, discovered that we see a scripture differently, they have said to me, well, you have your interpretation and I have mine. Or whenever I have suggested that a certain verse teaches a certain truth, what they have said to me is, well, that's just your interpretation. I've thought about this a good bit, and, and there are, I'm sure, at least two different reasons why someone will say to another person, that's just your interpretation. There may be more, but I can think of at least two. For some people, I really think that what this phrase is, it's just a, a sort of a, a nicer way of saying you're wrong. They don't think that the scripture means what I think it means. And they're pretty sure that the reason that that, that is, is that I've somehow put some kind of particular spin on the passage. And so I'm wrong about that. But they don't want to just come out and tell me I'm wrong because, well, oh, maybe that's a little bit rude. So what they say instead is, that's just your interpretation. I'm, I'm convinced that some people have said that to me for that reason. The other reason that someone might say that's just your interpretation is that there are a fair number of people who don't see the Bible the way that I do. For them, the Bible does mean different things to different people, maybe even different things to the same people in different situations. When they say to me, that's just your interpretation, what they're saying is not that I'm necessarily wrong. What they're saying is that in this particular situation, at this particular time, that might be the message that God is sending to me. But for them, in their particular situation, at this particular time, the passage means something else to them. In fact, some people are so convinced that this is the right way to understand the Bible that they treat it, well... They treat it almost like a Ouija board. They go to the Bible with a question, and they keep reading until they find a string of words that appears to answer the question on their mind. I mean, for example, someone might get a lucrative uh, job offer that's overseas, and they're wondering whether they ought to accept the position or not. Well, so they get their Bible out. And they start flipping through it. They're reading a passage here. They're reading a passage there. And then they discover this line from Genesis 12 and verse 1, which says, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. And they conclude that God wants them to accept the job overseas because he's led them somehow, supernaturally, providentially, he's led them to that line. And that is ignoring the fact that the very first line of that is, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. But they conclude that God has a hand in this. That, and, and the problem with that, and I believe there is a problem with that, is that it's just too easy to find a sentence in the Bible that would really justify and support doing, well, almost anything. There, there are that many words in the Bible. We could find a phrase. People often will say, well, you can prove anything by the Bible, and this is the kind of thing I think that they mean. You can find a string of words that can sort of sound like they mean all kinds of things when taken out of their natural context. Now, now some other people will take an approach that we might refer to as Bible roulette. And, and with this method, what they do is they kind of open their Bible at random, and the first passage upon which their eye falls, well, that's God's word for them that day. Again, the idea is that God has led them to do this. I'm going to suggest to you that the only reliable method for understanding what is written is the same method that we use to understand anything that is written or anything that is said. The goal is to figure out what is it that the writer or the speaker is trying to communicate. That's really what interpretation is. It is determining the thought or the intent of the original writer or speaker. Let me share a quote with you from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia where this scholarly work addresses the general principles of interpretation. Here's, here's what it says. It says, A person has interpreted the thoughts of another when he has in his own mind a correct reproduction or photograph of the thought 
as it was conceived in the mind of the original writer or speaker. It is accordingly a purely reproductive process involving no originality of thought on the part of the interpreter. It continues to say this, if the latter adds anything of his own, it is eisegesis and not exegesis. The moment the Bible student has in his own mind what was in the mind of the author or authors of the Bible books when these were written, he has interpreted the thought of the scriptures. And I want to just emphasize two aspects of that quote. Interpretation is simply trying to obtain the thought of the original writer or the speaker. And the second is, we're not supposed to add anything of our own. And, and that is so tempting, isn't it? But these two concepts are important. So many people today would like to ignore one or both of these things, but this is what it means to interpret the Bible. This is what it means to understand the Bible. What is it trying to say? Not, what does it make me think about when I read it? Before we ever jump to what a passage means for us in a particular situation of our life or a particular passage that we're reading, it is essential to understand what is the biblical author trying to say in, in, in that context. We have to discipline ourselves to put the text first and our own needs, our own desires to apply what is said second. The words of the Bible are not there simply to stimulate our thinking. Of course they do that. They do that very well. But they are there to communicate truth to us. The most important question that we need to ask ourselves, we study the Bible, is what is the writer trying to tell me? God says in his word exactly what he wants to say. Being who he is, he says it exactly the way he thought it needed to be said. We don't need to come up with our own ideas about what God means. What we need to understand is what he means. What does he say? So, to help with that, let me offer some questions we might want to ask ourselves as we are reading or studying a Bible passage. Uh, these are not in any particular order necessarily. Uh, one question we might want to ask is, what type of communication is the passage? This is really a pretty important question. Uh, imagine that we're watching television. We hear someone on the screen say, the president's chief of staff is taking bribes. To make sense of that statement, the first step we would take, and we take it automatically, really, is to remember what kind of show we're watching. If it is a late night comedy show, then we would interpret or understand that statement to be an attempt to make a joke. We would expect, you know, in, in TV humor, we would expect gossip about political leaders to be amplified in order to be funny. If the show that we were watching was a fictional drama, then we would interpret or understand the statement to be a possible clue to the story. We would recognize that the president's chief of staff is a fictional character, not the real character in Washington. On the other hand, if we're watching the evening news, we would understand that statement a completely different way. We would interpret that statement as an allegation about a real person. Comedy, drama, news are three different television genres, three types of communication. And we know the rules. We instinctively know the rules for understanding things that are said within each one of them. Well, in a similar way, although we sometimes don't think about this, there are different genres of communication in the Bible. In the Bible, we have books of history and, and prophecy and poetry and letters, and we have all kinds of different kinds of writing. And verses of Scripture within each of these genres needs to be handled differently. For example, the Psalms depend very heavily on poetic imagery. Now, the historical writings tend to be fairly straightforward narrative. In the letters, especially the letters of the Apostle Paul, they depend heavily on logic, and, and Paul writes with a real sense of authority. Sometimes, even within a single book, we find different genres of communication. One good example is the book of Daniel. We find some historical narrative, we find some prophecy, we even find some something that we call apocalyptic language, which is language that's written in kind of a code, something that the original readers of those words would have understood a lot better than we do. But we need to know what type of communication it is. The second thing we might ask ourselves is this. What's the context? Now, we, that's kind of obvious. You knew we'd talk about this one, right? We always need to know, for example, who is doing the speaking. 
Truth is, there are some speakers in the Scripture who are unreliable. I mean, after all, we find the statements made by Satan in the Scriptures, and he's the father of lies. Uh, think about the book of Job. Uh, Job's three friends who make many statements about why Job is undergoing the suffering he's undergoing. And they were wrong about that. And God says they were wrong about that later in the book. So we always need to know who's doing the talking, to whom is, are these words being said or written. But the context is important. We need to know for a fact that all of the commands in the Bible are not for us. The Jews were given many commands in the Law of Moses. Many things were said that they were to do that we are not asked to do under the new law. Uh, Jesus said things to his apostles that don't apply to us. The apostles themselves said things that do not apply to us. For example, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Are we all ambassadors for Christ as Paul was? Or is Paul speaking of himself and the co-workers? I suspect it's the latter. What are the circumstances within which something was said? Oftentimes that has a significant impact on what's meant. I mean, just as it would be hard for us to understand a statement made on TV without knowing, understanding what type of show we're watching, it's hard to understand a passage of Scripture. Statements where it's kind of important to know to whom these words are being said. And then is the language literal or figurative? Now, this is where it's easy for people to get tripped up. And I will say to you, it's easy for me to get tripped up sometimes over whether language is literal or figurative. Uh, now, there are people who would suggest to us that every word in the Bible should be taken literally. That it's all literal, there is no figurative language in the Bible. People who would suggest that, I would suspect, don't really know that much about the Bible because there are clearly things that are figurative. And even someone who says that he takes everything literally in the Bible does not really do that. I've never met anyone who believed that Jesus was literally a vine. As he says in John 15 in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Clearly there are all kinds of metaphors and, 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 and similes and comparisons and figurative language in the scriptures. One of the clearest examples is the use of figurative language in Malachi 4 in verses 5 and 6. In Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6, the prophet says this, he says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So the Lord says, I'm sending Elijah. And we know for certain that he was not talking about literally sending Elijah back in, in a physical sense because in Luke 1, Verses 13 through 17, it tells us so. It's John the Baptist who fulfills this prophecy. He's talking about John the Baptist coming to do this. Jesus also says it in Matthew 11 and verse 14. If you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. So that language back in Malachi is not literal. It was figurative language. There's nothing wrong with figurative language. In a lot of ways illustrations and figurative language can help to communicate truth in, in very impressive ways. I used to think, I used to think that this was really the biggest problem. This literal versus figurative thing, this inability to distinguish between those two, that's really the biggest problem in misunderstanding all the passages in Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel that people, that people kind of you know, have these problems with. But the more I thought about it, I don't really think that is the problem. I think the problem really is more the one we talked about earlier, that, that people bring this preconceived idea about what kind of communication the Bible is and, and do tend to treat it more like, well, a Ouija board, looking for phrases and sentences that will confirm the views that they've been taught or that they've come up with on their own. But let's make some observations about interpretations because uh, you know, I suspect that I'm not the only one who's had someone say to them, well, that's just your interpretation. Or, you know, you have your interpretation and I have mine. One thing we know, and everyone should know, about interpretations is that they may differ. 
Well, sure, they may differ. Different people may read the same Bible passage and come away with a different understanding of what that passage teaches. We have examples of that happening in the Bible itself. We talked this morning in our Bible class about the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, just think about those two Jewish groups. They studied the same Old Testament scriptures. And yet the Pharisees understood that there would be a resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees understood that there would not be a resurrection from the dead. Well, the Pharisees were right. The Sadducees were wrong. They had an understanding of whatever passages they read in, in the old law, and they understood them incorrectly. The Pharisees understood it right. There, there was a resurrection from the dead. Or, if we think about what's found in John chapter 21. Let me get you to open your Bibles to John chapter 21. Let's read John chapter 21, starting in verse 18. John 21, starting in verse 18. Jesus is speaking to Peter. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? So here's a statement that the Lord Jesus himself makes. He's talking to Peter. And Peter says, you know, he's been given this information that doesn't sound all that pleasant, I'm sure, about the kind of death he's going to die and his service to, to the Lord. And, and, and so he sees this other disciple and he says, well, okay, you've given me the information about me. What about him? What's going to happen to him? I can sort of see Peter wanting to know that. And what Jesus says to him is, what's that to you? If I want him to stay for all eternity, if I want him to never, then, then you follow me. What matters, Peter, is, is what I've told you. And yet, because of what Jesus said about if I want him to remain until I come, that's none of your business. Some people interpreted that incorrectly. It, they, they came to understand Jesus to be saying, well, that means he's not ever going to die. And that's not what he said. And the passage has to correct that here. That's not what he said. So sure, we can look at a passage and we can understand it differently. That doesn't mean because we understand it differently that we're both understanding it correctly because the truth is interpretations may be right and they may be wrong. The Pharisees were right about the resurrection. The Sadducees were wrong. You remember what Jesus, in fact, told the Sadducees when this came up between them? In Matthew 22 and verse 29, he said, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. They did not understand it. They did not interpret it correctly. That can happen, but that doesn't mean that they're right. This idea of, well, you've got your interpretation and I've got mine, kind of suggests that it's okay for us both to have different interpretations. That's really not the case. We might see things differently. That doesn't mean that we're both right. It doesn't even, in fact, mean that either one of us is right. We might both be wrong. Different interpretations of the same passage cannot be correct. Let me also suggest that wrong interpretations, wrong understanding, can lead to destruction. Look, if you would, in 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 14. 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 14. Peter writes these words. He says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures, to their own destruction. Here Peter says, there are some things that Paul writes that are hard to understand. 
And some people don't understand them correctly. They, they distort these things. They, they're, they're not taught well enough to understand. They, they're not stable enough to understand. They don't, they don't understand them, and, and that contributes to their own destruction. It is important to understand correctly. And for us to understand correctly, a point that was made near the end of our class this morning is that correct interpretation does require a love of the truth. Since there are things that are challenging in the scriptures, it is a big mistake for us to take a first glance at a passage, feel like we now understand everything that it says to us, and never feel like we ever have to read that passage again. We should be devoting ourselves to a study of this word. We should be reading it over and over and over again, studying it, thinking about it, making connections between passages from, from one book to another, putting things together. That's, that's the kind of devotion that we need. We have to love the truth to do that. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, starting in verse 7, Paul writes, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. A love of the truth is necessary to be saved. This is something that we have to want. We have to want it. And wanting it won't make it easier, but wanting it will keep us at it. Because if we want to understand it, some of this we're going to have to work at. That's okay. Look what God's done for us. Even giving us this word. That's okay for us to work at it. We should be happy to work at it. It should be a blessing for us to work at it. We need to love what He's written to us. We need to love it enough that we want to know exactly what He says. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2, in verse 15, Paul writes these words to Timothy. He says, Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. We, we want that. I'm convinced that we want that. We want to be people who accurately handle the word of truth. That's what everyone who loves the Lord Jesus should want. And so maybe these ideas about interpretation, which I know is mostly review for most of us, but maybe these things will be, maybe it'd be a good thing to be reminded of these things. It's so very important. God has done his part. He has communicated to us through this word. There's nothing wrong with this word. But do we love it enough to dig it out, to find out what he would have us to do? Let me ask you a question. Just as sort of a little practical application here. How would we interpret Acts 2 and verse 38? Now remember, when I say how would we interpret that, I'm not asking what it could mean. I'm asking what was in Peter's mind when he said it. Well, what type of communication is this? We think about the type of communication. We find that it is historical narrative. Uh, so fairly straightforward. We like fairly straightforward. What is the context the Apostle Peter is preaching to a crowd that is gathered because the Holy Spirit had fallen on the Apostles. He's just told them that this Jesus, whom they had crucified, had been raised from the dead, and that God had made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 tells us that when they heard Peter's words, they were pierced to the heart, and they asked Peter and the rest of the Apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And the words that Peter speaks in verse 38 are in response to that question. So that's the context. Peter is answering a question that was asked by those who had been participants in, in, in the crucifixion of Jesus. They've now discovered that Jesus is the Lord, He is the Christ, and they are no doubt somewhat dismayed. <coughs> Brethren, what shall we do? And he tells them, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. A question we'd also ask about this passage is, are Peter's words here intended only for those who asked that question back in verse 37? And the answer to that is clearly no. If we look in verse 39, 
For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And then down in verse 47, we find they were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So these words that Peter responded to that question, people, even days afterwards, are still responding in that kind of way. Then the Lord is adding to those number who were being saved. Is the language here literal or figurative? Absolutely no reason to see it as figurative in any way. So what's being communicated here? Here are people who have sinned, including some who were participants in having the Lord crucified. And Peter tells them that by repenting and by being baptized, they can receive the forgiveness of their sins. He further says that the promise of salvation is available to them, to their children, to those who are far off, as many as would respond to those words. And the writer says that those who heard the message and responded to it were saved. So what we have here is an example of how men can be saved from their sins. Now, I don't have to tell you that there are people who would interpret that, who would understand that differently. But what's the real question here? What is meant by these words? What was the intent of Luke, the writer of this book of Acts? What was the intent of the Holy Spirit inspiring him to write these words? It was to communicate this. This is one of many places we find in the New Testament where men are told what they can do to be saved. Maybe there's someone here this morning who needs to do this very thing. Maybe you love the Lord. You know He's the Son of God. You have faith in Him. You have faith in God. You believe the Bible is God's Word. You understand that you should not sin. And you try not to sin. But we've all sinned. If that's your situation and you've not yet turned away from the sin in your life, if you've not been baptized in order to have your sins washed away, then you have not complied with the communication that God has given to men on how they become Christians, how they receive this forgiveness. The joyous thing is that you can. The joyous thing is that we all can. And if that's your need this morning, we would be thrilled to have a chance to help you with that. If you need to obey the gospel as we find it in the New Testament, We'd be happy to help you. If you have questions about this, after we're done here, I'd be happy to talk to you. There are a dozen men in here who'd be happy to talk to you about these things. But if we can help you in some spiritual way, give us a chance. Come forward while together we stand and while we sing.